You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. This week, we join Pastor Gary Ziegler as he teaches on the subject, How to Pray Correctly. This is part two. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When spirit food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. That which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is... God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is working mightily in my life, being confirmed with signs following, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. So I'm teaching on how to pray correctly. How to pray correctly. And I would like for you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of James. Turn to the book of James. Because we're going to be studying and looking at today's message on how to pray correctly. And why should we study on the subject of how to pray correctly? Because we've come to the conclusion that everybody doesn't know how to pray. And they're not getting results in what they think is prayer, because technically speaking, it's not biblical prayer. So we're going to be looking at how to pray correctly. You still should be turning to the book of James, and when you get there, turn to chapter 4, James chapter 4. We know that people do things that they may feel are effective, but feelings really don't have anything to do with the principle of praying correctly. Doesn't mean that you can't feel good, but it means that even if you don't feel good, if you pray correctly, you're going to get results. And so we want you to really focus on how to pray correctly. And when you have James chapter 4, say, Amen. Amen. All right, James chapter 4, and we'll look at verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust, and have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight, and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So the first thing that we see in James chapter 4, and we want to bring out in verse 2, is that individuals may not be praying at all. Well, individuals that are not praying certainly couldn't be having answered prayer because they're not what? They're not praying. So we want to establish that there are some people that are not praying at all. Therefore, they could not possibly be receiving answered prayer because they don't have any confidence in prayer. And the Bible says, you have not because you what? Ask not. There are individuals that are not asking God for anything. Consequently, they're living their lives attempting to just do things by their own effort and energy. And that's really a difficult way to live as a Christian. Jesus came, he said, so that you might have life and have life how? More abundantly. Now, in verse 3 of James chapter 4, he said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Now notice that he said there are people who are asking, meaning that they're praying, but he said you ask and you receive not. Underline the words, receive not. See, there are individuals that don't know how to ask. They are asking, but they're not asking correctly. 
They're praying, but they're not praying correctly. Consequently, they're not what? According to the scriptures, they're not what? Receiving. So we saw, number one, that there are individuals that don't ask. He said, you ask, you don't ask. Since you don't ask, you can't possibly receive what you don't ask. You ask not, therefore you can't have what you've never asked for. And then he said, there are individuals that are asking, but they ask amiss. And the word amiss means incorrectly, wrong, improper. So there are people who think, well, God's got to hear me when I make my request because if I ask him, he's just got to answer me. And God says, when you ask, you have to ask correctly. Did you know that you have to ask correctly? So now we come to the conclusion that we must find out how do you pray correctly? We have verses 2 and 3 of James chapter 4. Let's all read that out loud together. You lust and have not, come on, and you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So God says, there are individuals that are asking, but they're not going to receive because they're not asking properly. And they're not asking, or we could say it this way, according to the rules of prayer. You see, God made it possible for his children to make withdrawals from their heavenly accounts. But he made it impossible for the devil to make withdrawals from your heavenly accounts. So there is no such thing as bank hacking with God. There is a bank account with your name on it, as it were, because you're in Christ Jesus, but you're the one who is authorized to make withdrawals from your account. But you're going to have to make the withdrawals accordingly. Even when you put money in the bank now, you can have all kinds of finances in the bank. And when you go, you have to make withdrawal slips, or you've got to use the proper card, electronic debit card or credit card. But when you access those monies, you've got to do it according to the system that's set up. And if you don't do it according to the system, you're going to be what? You're just not going to get any results. So even though the money is there in the account, even though the money belongs to you legally, but if you don't withdraw it legally, you cannot enjoy the benefit of having it. Am I making any sense to you here? So we want to show the believers in Christ Jesus that you have accounts with your name on it, and you're going to have to make withdrawals from those accounts so that you can enjoy your life. God wants you to be a blessed individual. He wants you to be blessed as a body of Christ collectively. But in order to receive from God, you have to ask correctly. Now, there are individuals that say, well, I just believe whatever you do is whatever you do. That's not the case at all. He already said in verse 2, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. And we'll see that James is in chapter 4 considering the things that he already said in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verse 1 of James, he talks about how we as believers in Christ Jesus, we have to deal with life issues. A person could say, well, I'm really doing good and wonderful today, but something may come up tomorrow where you have need of things. How do you get those needs met tomorrow? So you want to be in a position where you always know how to cooperate with the bank of heaven. I'll just use the term bank of heaven. So now looking at James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, 
count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, the word temptations is the word defined as trials, tests, difficulties, hardships. So when you come into a place where you're being tried, you're being tested, you're dealing with difficult circumstances, he said, you need to be sad about it. No, he said, you need to be what? Glad about it. Count it all joy. The word joy means to be glad when you look it up in the dictionary. So when he says count it all joy when you fall into divers, trials, tests, temptations, or you're dealing with difficult circumstances, why would I count it an opportunity to be happy? Because I must know something that supersedes whatever I'm facing. See, when I'm asked, by my car, light coming on that says, you need fuel, then I'm not saddened by it if I have the provision already to meet the need. And as long as they have gas stations that are there with gas, I'm not saddened by the put fuel in the car indicator. Why? Because that's the way it works. So in life, you're going to have to deal with some situations, circumstances, things that appear to be difficult. You're going to be dealing with those things. Because such is the case after Adam and Eve sinned against God. Difficulties are in the world. Now somebody said, oh, I don't like difficult circumstances or situations. I don't like to be tried or tested. God, I wish you wouldn't test me. God said, I'm not testing you. I'm not trying you. I'm not putting you into a difficult situation to try to find out what you will do. Why? Because God already knows what you'll do all the time. He doesn't need to put something on you to find out what you'll do. So, since God already knows you through and through, and He knows your end from the beginning, and He knows your beginning to the end, He doesn't need to put you in a difficulty to try to test you to see how you're going to react. He already knows how you will react. So then who's bringing these challenges? The devil. And the devil doesn't mind bringing challenges. So that's why he doesn't say, if you fall into divers, trials, tests, or temptations, negative circumstances, he says what? When you fall into them. Now, looking at James chapter 1 again, verse 2, my brother, count it all joy, or be glad, when you fall into divers, temptations. Knowing this, so you can't be happy if you don't know this, but if you do know this, which I'm getting ready to tell you, you can be what? You can be happy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And notice how he says the trials, the tests, the difficulties are really a trying of your what? Of your faith. See, you thought the devil was attacking you. Actually, the devil doesn't like what you possess. What you possess is faith. And your faith is what's a problem for the devil. Because your faith can move mountains. Your faith can make things possible that appear to be impossible to those who have no faith. You're in possession of a supernatural substance that the devil is tremendously afraid you may understand and learn how to use it. But God designed the system to work this way. When I say the system, he designed your faith to be able to rise to the level and deal with anything you can possibly face on this planet, in this earth. Why? Because your faith comes from God. And your faith has substance. And your faith accesses, gives you that, as it were, it gives you the ability to go to the bank of heaven and receive from the accounts that are filled with deposits on your behalf. And the devil doesn't want you to know how much you can access. And so that's why when he attacks, he being the devil, he attacks because he's trying to get you distracted, discouraged, 
or just completely keep you so involved in circumstances where you forget how to use your faith. Or you just don't pay attention. I need to address this situation by what? With my faith. Now we're still looking at James chapter 1. And he says in verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So everybody say, when I'm dealing with tests, trials, temptations, difficult circumstances, it's not personally against me. It's my faith that's being tried. Got it? Now, God doesn't have to try your faith because God already knows what He gave you when He gave you faith. See, you received the measure of faith at the time you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For by grace are you saved through faith. You couldn't even be saved if you didn't have faith. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. So in order for you to be a Christian, you have to possess what's called faith. And the Bible says God gave all of them who have received Jesus Christ. God gave you the measure of faith. So you are in position of a person who has faith. And when circumstances are coming against you, it is because the devil doesn't want you to understand how your faith is important for you to receive from God. But God designed the system, meaning that the devil can't do anything above what your faith can handle. The devil's limited, but you're not limited in your faith. Now, as we read James chapter 1, verse 4 again, he says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting. The word wanting means lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And every time you see the word ask, I want you to think about the word pray. Because when he says ask of God, that's another way of saying what? Pray. Good. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be what? It shall be given him. Now, wisdom, let me give you the definition of wisdom. The word wisdom is practical application of the knowledge that you have from God. See, you can read the Bible, have knowledge of Scripture. But some people are not operating in wisdom. Consequently, they can quote Scripture, but they never actually get the benefit of what the Scripture says because they don't know how to apply it in real life. Have you ever seen anybody standing on the street corner talking about, give me some money, God bless you? Well, if God blessed me like you said he's supposed to bless me, like you're being blessed, i would end up on the corner like you're on the corner. I don't want you to, I don't want that kind of blessing. No, thank you very much. Nope, 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 nope. Because I don't want to stand on the corner begging. So a person who says, God bless you, and they have scriptures on their sign, and they're saying, God bless you, can you give me some money? That individual is not living consistently. Can you see the inconsistency? You understand that? And when they say, God bless you, wait a minute. If you're wishing something on me that you believe is good, why can't you receive the God bless you yourself and get off the corner? So apparently, the word God bless you and or the scripture that they may have on their sign is not enough to get them off the street corner because they don't have what? Uh, they don't have what? They don't have wisdom. They know something about God. That's why they say God bless you. They know something about Scripture. That's why they have John 3.16 on their side. But what is it that keeps them from being on the corner? Wisdom. How to get from the Scripture an opportunity and an understanding of how to apply it so that you won't be on the corner anymore. Are you with me? So James said that if an individual lacks wisdom, verse 5, James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Upbraideth not means God's not twisted. When a woman gets her hair corn rolled, or you know what I mean? That's upbraided, right? 
So he says, God's not involved in giving you twisted stuff. God's not going to twist you up. He's not going to give you side winder information where you got to go to find out what does God really mean. God says, when I give it to you, you'll understand it. Now, he says, who give it to all men liberally. And notice, I like the fact that he says, I give to all, not a few, I give to all men liberally, and, and I'm not what? I'm not going to give it to you twisted. And abraded, which is the word twisted, not. And then he goes on to say, and it shall be given him. But let him ask, verse 6, in what? Let him ask how? Let him ask how? Let him ask in faith. Underline those words. You must ask in faith. Now, you have to ask, but not only do you have to ask, you've got to ask in faith. Somebody would say, well, you mean I just got to ask with a good attitude, or I just got to ask with feelings. No, he's not saying that feelings, and there's nothing wrong with having a good attitude, but he's going to describe how an individual can ask in faith, and because if you can ask in faith, you could also ask what? Out of faith. If a person can ask in faith, it must be possible then for a person to ask outside of faith. Did you get that? So we're teaching on the subject how to pray correctly. And we saw in James chapter 4 that there were individuals that weren't asking at all. So you can't possibly get a request answered if you're not asking. You're making no request. Number two, we also saw in chapter 4 how an individual can ask incorrectly, or he used the word amiss, and if they ask incorrectly, you still get no result, results at all. Got it? If I go to the bank and I put down the wrong account number on my withdrawal slip, are they going to honor my request? No, not at all. What if I just hand him a piece of paper and just wrote on there, give me my money and I need it now? What's going to happen? There may be some people waiting for me right outside the door with something drawn, right? Why? Because you didn't ask the right way. If you don't ask the right way, not only will you not get it, or they may give it to you, but they're going to push that button, you're going to have to answer for that. Now, we understand that in the natural. Why don't people understand that with God? You can't just throw anything out and say, oh, God, <laughs> oh, God, I need it and I need it now. And God is like, hold on, did you ask correctly? So we see that a person can ask in faith, and a person, therefore, could ask out of faith. Let's read and see if the Bible gives us insight of what it means to ask in faith. We're still there in James chapter 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith. And circle that word in because I want that to be highlighted because an individual can ask out of faith. You might as well then ask in faith because he said, but let him ask in faith. And then he not noticed what we we're going to read in verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7, for let not that man, let not that man, what man? What man? The man that's what? The man that's wavering. You could say man, woman, boy or girl that is a Christian. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. See, it's not that God doesn't give. It's just that an individual who's wavering won't receive. And that ties in with what we read in chapter 4. Because an individual that asks incorrectly, they will not receive. So an individual who's asking out of faith is like a person who is what? Wavering. Now what's a wavering individual? That's an individual that says, well, I'm convinced that God's word is true today, but you know what? I'm equally convinced that it's possible His Word won't work for me today. 
So if an individual keeps going to the positive side of having confidence or trust in the Lord's Word, but then the individual says, well, I'm just as convinced that, you know, it may not work too. Where are they going to end up? All of you that are in here, have you had to take classes in math? And you remember the integers you had to learn? That there is a zero in the, mirror, in the middle, and then there's positive side, then there's the negative side, and you had to learn how to work your mathematical equations to come up with your, your, your numbers. Because if you have four positive moves, and then you also have four negative moves, where are you back at? At zero. If you have four negative moves and you've got four positive moves, where are you? You're back at zero. So an individual who is wavering is like an individual on that, on that line, the number line. They're just as convinced about God keeping his word today, but then they're like, well, you know what? He may not keep his word for me, but you know what? Based upon the, 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 the seriousness of what I'm facing, he may not even know about me at all. And they could go what? They had four moves in the positive, but they got 16 moves in the negative. Are you listening? And then if you've got plus four and 16 negative, where are we? Negative where? Come on, y'all. Did you go to school? Negative 12. So at position negative 12, am I positive or negative? I'm negative what? 12. And there are many Christians that are negative 12. How do you know they're on negative 12? Because when you open their mouth about God meeting their needs, they're like, oh, no, no. When it rains, it pours. Now, I've been here before. I know God ain't coming through. And they're constantly talking negative because they're in their what? Negative place. And that's why God says, when an individual prays, you must pray in faith and don't what? Don't waver. Don't entertain. Don't accept. Don't roll with the negativity that's coming at you to try to get you to change your position. Why? Because your position of positive confidence in God's Word will be rewarded. You will get exactly what it is you ask for. So don't be moved by negative circumstances. But the devil knows that there are Christians that don't have this spiritual understanding. So what he'll do is he'll try to go, boom. Or he'll erect a circumstance that's really negative. Or he'll try to say, well, you know what? Yeah, you ask God, and yeah, you are in the positive. But if you really considered how much negative stuff that's really going on. So the individual that was positive has now began to be engulfed by paying attention to the negative circumstances. And it's just like driving. It, wherever you keep your eyes, that's where you're going to go. If you stay focused on the promises of God, then you'll be confident that what God has promised, He is well able to perform it in your life. You'll be fully persuaded, but you've got to keep your eyes on God's promises. But if you get distracted and start talking about how bad things are and start getting into what you're now having to face, next thing you know, you're so busy drifting over to the left. My left? You're right. You understand? The negative side, that even though you thought you were in the the positive, you find yourself to be in the negative. How do you know? Examine what you're saying. Some Christians are so negative that when you give them a positive word, they fight you on it. Mm-hmm, that ain't going to happen. No, that's impossible. No, no, see, let me educate you because you're wrong, oh positive believer. I've got to let you know. You know, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes level to the ground. Oh, Lord, he knows I'm just a worm. Oh, God, can you do something for me? Just give me a piece of the breadcrumb. I'm not asking for the full loaf of bread. I'm not asking for a whole piece. Just give me a, a, just a crumb. They, they start going into all these different gyrations mentally. Are you listening? And then they wonder, why well, hasn't God moved in my life? God is like the bank of heaven operates as correctly and as Exactly 
as better than a natural bank. Better than a natural bank. And you've got to make your withdrawal according to His Word. And if you don't make it according to His Word, you could spend your whole life being negative against God. And then you're like, God, why didn't you do something for me? God's like, all this in heaven belongs to you, and you didn't get any of it because you did not take the time to walk correctly in your prayer life. And people were blaming God. But it's interesting, everything I pray about, I get Everything, everything I pray about, I get. There is no such thing as an unanswered prayer with me. There is no, I don't, I don't operate like that. Why not? Because there's a positive, proper way, correct way to pray. And if I'm teaching you how to pray correctly, don't you think I'm participating in that which I'm teaching? And if I don't get a positive result, Meaning that if I pray incorrectly, I already know. Just like he said. He said, a wavering individual don't even think you're receiving anything. Now, that's God that wrote that, had that written. In other words, if I get out of faith and I'm negative, I can't be saying, hey, God, what's going on? Why didn't you manifest? He's like, you know why he didn't manifest. Because you're operating in wavering out of faith. So you can't blame God. The bank of heaven works. And it's open all the time. There is no such thing as hours of operation. It's just always operating. The question is, are you coming to make your withdrawals correctly? This is really good teaching. I'm loving this. Praise God. And I'm glad a few of you are as well. All right. No, you all are. All right. Now, we're looking at James chapter 1, aren't we? And we see here in verse 6, reading to verse 7, says, But let him ask how? In faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in what? All his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Unstable means you're not in a position to receive because you have taken yourself out of the place of receiving. And when I found out that answered prayer is on me and not on God, then I can't get mad at God for how I'm living. I only get what it is I'm willing to receive. And if I don't ask, I don't receive. And if I ask incorrectly, I can't receive. If I'm wavering, I can't receive. So it would behoove me, it would be to my best advantage to know how to pray and pray what? Pray what? Pray correctly. Now turn over to Luke, the 18th chapter. Luke chapter 18. This is vitally important. When I found out that prayer results are my responsibility, then I no longer began to hold God responsible for things in the past that didn't happen. See, there are some people that prayed in the past, didn't get any results, and they're actually angry or mad with God. Because they felt like God let them down. And then you say, come on, let's pray. They're like, no, no, I don't want to pray. All right, yeah, yeah, you pray, and I'll just I'll stand here and act like I'm doing something. But in reality, they've got an issue with God. They're, they're, they're rather ticked off with God. It's like being angry with the bank for not giving you the money that you didn't receive because you didn't follow the procedures. And there are, there are lots of Christians like that. And the thing is, You all have a Bible. If you have a Bible, raise your hand. The instruction manual on how to make withdrawals is right here. If you don't know how to make the proper withdrawals, that's on you, not on him. Because your ignorance is what's keeping you from being blessed. You don't know how to pray? It's not on God. That's on you. Why? 
God made it possible for you to get this book. If you don't study it, if you don't understand it, you don't go to church, you don't receive instruction, that's on you, ignorant fool. Why? I'm living hard. That's because you don't know how to what? Live good. I know this sounds like I'm a rebel. I'm only a, re- a rebel against ignorance. Because God said in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You operate in ignorance, you're the one who's going to suffer from it. Because rest assured, God's got it going on. And the people that know how to cooperate with God have it going on. You're there in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he, he is referring to Jesus, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to what? Pray and not what? And not faint. Now he is referring to Jesus He spake a parable, that means a simile, an analogy. He gave a principal expression that is like unto, but yet he gave this principal expression so that people would always know what? That they should pray and not faint. Not faint means don't stop praying. Don't give up. Don't pray. With the attitude that, well, I prayed today, but I don't know when I'll ever pray again. See, he said men ought to always pray and not faint. And the devil twists scriptures, and he'll try to get people to say, well, that means when you pray, you've got to pray and say exactly what you want all the time, every time, because, you know, you just got to keep on repeating it. If you keep praying about the same thing all the time, One minister said it this way. If you pray for something exactly the same way six times, a seventh time or seven times, he said the first one may have been correctly prayed, but the other six are prayed in unbelief. Because when you pray, you're supposed to have a confidence that you're doing it what? Correctly. Now turn over. I I just want you to see this parable statement that Jesus made. Uh, because you can read that on your own. But turn over back to, um, let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and look at this. Matthew chapter 6 now. Matthew the 6th chapter. Because there are individuals that believe that being repetitive in their request means that God really is going to hear them and do something for them. Would you all agree? Have you ever heard anybody just get, they get some people are obnoxious? I remember Brother Hagin talking about an individual. He went to minister at their church, and they took time to pray. You know, after all, he said, come on, Brother Hagin, let's, let's pray before we have service. And so they were on their knees at the altar, and the guy was like, oh, Lord, move, Lord, in this service. Move, Lord. Lord, move, Lord. Oh, Lord, move, Lord. Move, Lord. Lord, Lord, move, Lord. Move, Lord. Oh, Lord, move. By some hook or crook. Lord, move. Move some way, somehow. Move, Lord. I mean, in 15 minutes passed. And Brother Hagin was trying to be, you know, he was trying to be gracious and cordial, but he found out that this individual is stuck in a groove. And what's the groove that they're on? The groove is that they believe That God's going to do something by much repetition. As if to say God can't hear. Now, he that made the ears can certainly hear. He that made the eyes can certainly see. He that made your mouth can certainly speak. So you're not going to get God to move on the basis of repetition. Are you listening? But some people fall into that zone, and we see here in Matthew, the sixth chapter, that there are people that were doing it back then. When Jesus walked the earth. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse six. Oh, verse five. Verse five. Matthew, six, chapter, verse five. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. So, what's the purpose of praying? To be seen of men. What's their purpose? To be seen of men. So what, really, what's going on in their heart? To be seen of men. 
I want everybody to see that I can get down in prayer. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it that they're going to get? What they wanted, which is to be seen. That's it. Their prayer is not directed to God in faith. The object of their heart is to be seen. And all I'm telling you, there are some people that say, oh, oh, I'm praying. But really, what's going on in your heart? Because answered prayer demands that your heart be in connection with God. Because faith is a product of your heart. You cannot go to the bank and give them seashells and say, I'd like for you to turn these into dollar bills. Again, people may be waiting outside the door for you. Why? Because you've got to use correct currency in order for the bank to benefit you. Are you getting that? All right. So in Matthew, the sixth chapter, he says in verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men, Verily, which means truthfully or faithfully, I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, that means you, when thou prayest, not if, but what? When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Heathen are people that don't have a covenant with God. See, a person that doesn't have a covenant with God, God's not in agreement with that. In other words, you don't have a bank account with the bank. See, if you don't have a bank account with the bank, you better not go in there asking for your money to be pulled out because they sure enough going to push the button on you. Why? You, are, you have no account here with your name on it. Don't ask me for some money when you're not even a member. You have no deposit account here. Are you listening? But the person who is a heathen that's not a Christian, they have no what? They have no account with God. That's the reason why you must make sure in order for you to pray effectively as a Christian, you got to know you're a Christian. And there are some people that say, well, I do good things, and God's got to hear me because I pray. God said, you don't have an account. I don't have to hear you about anything. Now, in John's Gospel, the ninth chapter, there was a man that was healed from blindness, and they accused him of being healed incorrectly. He's like, look, I see. What are you talking about? I'm healed incorrectly. I, I believe in Jesus. And, and they said, and the man, the, the, the crowd of people that were on his case, they were like, well, you believe in Jesus. We know that this man is a sinner. He said, it's a strange thing. How could he be a sinner and open up my eyes? We know, he said, we know that God don't hear prayer, sinners when they pray. We know that, don't we? Well, see, he was telling his accusers and the people that were mad at him for getting results, he told them, we know God don't hear sinners, don't we? So if Jesus were a sinner, how could he possibly heal my eyes? They were like, oh, you were a sinner. You were born in sin. Confused in iniquity. Get out of here. And they excommunicated him from the church. Why? Because he's messing with their theology. He's messing with their tradition. He's messing with their attitude. Their attitude is people can't get results with God. He says, well, I'm getting results with God. Yeah, but you're still, we don't like you anyway. And I'm telling you, when you start understanding how to pray correctly and things are manifesting in your life because God has honored His Word because you gave Him your Word, His Word, I'm telling you right now, there may be some people that are not going to be happy with you. Because it's almost like you're not being fair. What do you mean not fair? The world has a system set up to keep you struggling. They're not expecting you to be rich and wealthy. Are you kidding? If you're wealthy and you've got an abundance of supplies, you may be encouraged not to go punch some clock today. And then how do you run a society when people don't punch clocks? God wants you free. He wants you liberated. 
He wants you to have it where you're not punching clock, but you're actually getting everything you receive from the kingdom of God. And there's nothing wrong with working. I'm not saying that working is, a, is wrong, but he says when you work, understand this. You're going to be rewarded from God for the good work that you're doing. So don't ever get it twisted and think that oh, I'm going to get over by how many hours I punch in. It's not set up like that in the world. The world system is set up to always keep you struggling. So you have to operate in the supernatural power of God. You've got to go above the norm of society to have manifested in your life the abundance that God says belongs to you. You've got to know how to pray. Now, these individuals in Matthew, the sixth chapter, apparently they thought, if I go get repetitive with God, in other words, I keep repeating with God, verse 7 of Matthew, the sixth chapter, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their what? For their much speaking. So the example that I gave you about when Brother Hagin was praying at the altar, he was, Brother Hagin was saying, look, I'm going to pray and I'm going to get results. But the other person who is the church leader that invited him to come was all about begging and being repetitive in his begging and wondering why he wasn't getting results. He wasn't getting any results because he acted like a heathen, not a man of the covenant. And he was a preacher. And all I'm telling you, feelings have nothing to do with we're making your withdrawals from the bank account of heaven. Pastor Diggler, you keep talking about the bank account of heaven. What are you really talking about? I'm glad you asked. Turn over to First Peter. First Peter, chapter 1. First Peter, chapter 1. See, I understand how Jesus could be teaching people for three days and three nights, and they all forget to eat. They all forget to do other things, and they're just there with Jesus, listening to the Word. Why? Because when the Word is being taught, your spirit is literally receiving this information. Your spirit is being fed. Your faith is being fed. And you're getting knowledge from on high. And when that happens, you're not conscious of time. You're just not. You're just like, wait, wait a minute, we just opened up the Bible. You got to quit right now, Pastor Ziegler? I'm supposed to quit. I'm not going to, but I'm going to say goodbye to my TV audience, to our web audience. We love you. I wish you were here. You ought to make plans to be here. This would be the best investment of your time that you've ever made so that you can learn how to walk in the abundance that God has for you. So, sayonara. We love you. Next week, we'll see you. All right, those of us that are here, be grateful that you're here. Because we can go further. Are y'all willing to go a little further? All right, then. You're in First Peter chapter 1. Let's look at this together. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be what? Multiplied. Now that word peace is the word shalom. So that means blessings, health, prosperity be multiplied to you. That means if you think, I got it going on already. He said, now let it be multiplied to you. Ooh, I love that. Now let's read on further. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath, that's the old English word for has, begotten us. Begotten means he birthed us. He has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now a person may say, what do you mean he's begotten us again? Well, when he made Adam and Eve, they were made innocent. They belonged to God. After they sinned, they were what? Separated from the life and the nature of God. Now, we accepted God's extra instructions to receive Jesus to be reconciled to God. So God says, I've gotten you back how? Again. Why? Because I made you to fellowship with me. They started out fellowshipping with me. And now you're in a position where you can fellowship with me again. You were separated by 
sin. You were separated by spiritual death, separated from the life and the nature of God, but not anymore. Now you are reconciled to God, and you can enjoy fellowshipping with God, and He can move in your life because He's your Father. You are begotten of Him. That means you are His very own child. Now, anybody in here have any children? I don't ever want my children to suffer. I don't. In fact, it's the natural desire of a parent to want their children to have what? A better life than they had. That's the desire of a parent, to let their children have a better life than the life they live. And I mean, I'm living good, but we're setting it up so they can have a better life if Jesus tarries in his coming. If he don't tarry, we all go up. We're all just good. You understand? But I don't want my children to have to deal with certain things that we had to deal with. No, 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 not at all. Why? Because there's a better way. Why should they have to pay car payments when we can pay the car for them and make sure they don't have to go to work and be distracted from school when they can actually have a car that they drive, they can put gas in it, you understand? Or plug it into the electronic system. So you you understand, have solar panels or whatever you're going to do for the energy of your car. But those children who are coming up need to have what? They need to have transportation. I don't want them to have to walk. What kind of parent wants their children to have it hard? I'm not giving you anything. And you know, I made it up by my own bootstraps. Now you make it your own way. That's a cold-blooded individual. And please not, not let it come out of the mouth of a Christian. Because the Scripture says that a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That means you're supposed to be preparing for your kids to have kids, and those kids are supposed to have wealth in their life. Got it? So God has begotten us. And He's a good God. A Father of mercies and love and compassion. Now looking at chapter 1 of 1 Peter. You're still there? Verse 4. To an inheritance... Oh, let me read verse 3 so that we can go back. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. That means we have an inheritance. And what is the description of the inheritance? It's what? Incorruptible. That means it's not bad. What else? Undefiled. That means it's not, it's not dirty or nasty or twisted. And that what? That fate is not away. That means it ain't going anywhere. So the more time you have it, the more you still can enjoy it. Now, that's our inheritance. And notice what he said. That fate is not away, right? Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate is not away, reserved, reserved, reserved where? In heaven for you. Ah! 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 What do you mean, ah? That means I got all of this wonderful inheritance that's not corruptible, undefiled, that won't fade away. Good. Take me to it. It's reserved where? In heaven. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. So that's the catch. I got to go to heaven to get it. Uh, Actually, you just have to give heaven the currency, the medium of exchange to get it from heaven to earth. Y'all getting this? So you can't say that there's no inheritance. All of us have more than we can possibly ask or think or even imagine reserved in an account for us. Now the word reserved means that what? It's what? It's reserved. It's set aside. It's exclusive. It's exclusive for me. It's exclusive for you. There's stuff that's got your name on it. But you will never, ever, ever enjoy it unless you know how to make the withdrawal. Did you hear that? 
That's like, it's the people in the natural. I, I was explaining to my daughter. Uh, I went to school with some wealthy people when I was in high school. But I was aware that some of them were blowing their brains apart with drugs. So even though they were heirs of a wealthy fortune, they could never really enjoy their fortune because they had messed up their brains so bad, they don't even know what they have. Some of the people standing on the corner asking for money are those that I observed when I was in high school. Gray hair, standing there begging for money. Yeah, and their heirs, offspring of parents that made them mega rich, but they don't know how to get it because they've blown their brains apart. And the easiest thing for them to do is get up, look like whatever, who did it and what for, and stand there with the sign that somebody made for them or they made and just let people start giving to them. You could be given to people that are multi-millionaires, if not billionaires, and you think, I'm really doing good by handing them money. And they got enough money to buy this country or other countries, islands. They got enough money that they own industries, and you're handing them money. So who's more ignorant, them or you? Anyway, it's not a lesson to try to keep you from being compassionate to the poor, but you've got to understand the definition of a real poor person, not what's being broadcasted to you by a popular medium. Because there are people that say, give your charitable na- donation, and they're giving it to rich folks, like gambling. Everything in Las Vegas is paid for. Why are you giving them your money? Oh, let me, oh, shoot, let me get off of that. Let me get off of that. Because it's fun. Well, come up here. Put some money in my pocket. I'm going to hold my arm right here. Put the money in there. Put my arm down. Nope, you didn't win. Mm-mm. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Nope, you didn't win. Mm-mm. Hey, clean out my pocket. Make some more room. Nope, you didn't win. Are you listening? And then I may see the crowd dwindling some, and I, you understand. So what I'll do is, uh, you know, the crowd's getting kind of, they're not, they're not encouraged to gamble anymore. So now when you, dump, when you dump the pocket this time, just leave a few dollars in there. Okay? Okay. Now. Oh, you won. ding a ling a ling 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 Go on and get the few dollars. But, I, but I've made millions off of ignorant folks calling themselves having what? Fun. You can come to church and see and hear simple wisdom. You found out you have an inheritance and there is a reserve account for you? Well, pastor, if I got it in heaven, why isn't it manifested in my life? Because when you pray, you've got to pray correctly. You're still there in First Peter chapter 1? Look at verse 4 again. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate is not away, reserved where? In heaven for you. Now, Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So that you'll see out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word can be established. Ephesians chapter 1. I think I used another Bible. This page is gone. Ephesians chapter 1. This is the reason why I carry so many Bibles, because I'll be tearing them up. All right. And it's not bragging. I'm just saying, I'm going to find out what my inheritance is. I'm finding out what's, what's in reserve for me. I'm finding out what belongs to me. And if I know what belongs to me, guess what? I'm accessing it correctly. Ephesians chapter 1, are you there? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are in Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace. So the word peace again is, Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, hath is the old English word for has, who has blessed with an E-D, circle of E-D, which means what? Past tense. So that means already happened. Who hath or has blessed us 
with what? All spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places in Christ. That means we've already been blessed. We've already got all of the reserve with our benefits there. He's already done it. So somebody says, I wonder if the Lord's going to give me a house. Oh, Lord, are you going to give me a house? The Lord is like, look now, look, look. I got a house for you. But you're going to have to get it to manifest on planet Earth by your faith. That's why the people in Joshua chapter 1 were told, Wherever the soles of your feet shall tread, that have I given unto you for an inheritance. In other words, where your feet tread, I have provided it for you. So when you stand on it, declare that it's yours and operate like it's yours. Do the things necessary so they understand that it's yours because I've given it to you. Now God expects us to do our part. Walk by faith, not by sight. When you ask, ask in faith, not out of faith. How important is faith? The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Why? Because you can be a child of God and live your life, live and die like somebody who's not even in relationship to God. If you're outside of faith or walking in faith. And I'm not saying this to try to discourage anybody. I'm not discouraging anybody else. I'm just letting you know the reality. If you don't know how to make transactions, spiritual transactions from heaven to earth, you're at a disadvantage. Because the devil has ramped up his program. He says to everybody who's doing corruption, you ought to prosper. Them who call on the Lord, you get nothing. So the devil thinks. And then God, then the devil says, the devil says, the devil says, the devil says, not me. The devil says, God forbid you got a rich preacher. Why, why would the devil say that? Because uh, if you're a rock star, half naked, and you're running around screaming and shouting and got makeup on your face, and you're naked, and you're throwing yourself off into the crowd, you, know, you deserve all the money you can get. Or if you just happen to be, you know, gene pooled where you've got seven foot two structure and you can go and dunk a ball without even having to jump. You can just take your hand and throw the ball in the net and tell people, don't come underneath here. You deserve all the money you can get. Or if you can sing like a bird. I mean, we could actually go and get a bird and just record the bird and listen to the bird. But no, no, no. If you can sing like a bird and run around and jump up and down, turn a few turns, oh, oh, you need to get paid all the money you can possibly get. But if you're an individual that's giving people knowledge of how to get something from God, not just something, but learning how to work with God, walk with God in a pleasing manner so that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that individual, no, no, the devil says, don't give them anything. Why? They're trying to get over on you. Because if they really knew something, they wouldn't have anything. Now, I personally, I couldn't follow a poor preacher. Why? You can't teach me or bring me somewhere you haven't been. You don't know how to receive from God. How can you tell me how to get from God? Are you listening? So the minister should be an example. And that's the reason why the devil is like, any creature that we can find that's really teaching prosperity, then they, he mounts up a group of people that says, you got to stay away from them prosperity preachers. What, this, what should the people follow? Poverty pre preachers. Are you all aware of what's going on? Are you listening? You couldn't keep me away from church. This kind of teaching, the only thing that would keep me from being here is if I go to be with the Lord, and then I'm really getting good teaching at the feet of Jesus. Are you listening? Because he would come, you know, understand, we all go up in the rapture. I ain't going to be here. I'm up, he'd be up there learning and growing and being blessed. But the thing about it is, 
There are some people that feel like they don't need to be here consistently. And this is one lesson. And I'm holding back because of time. I'm holding back a lot more information I'd like to give. I've got to be listening to the Holy Ghost to tell you what Scripture to turn to. Because there are multiple Scriptures we can look at. Why are people not here like they should be? Because they are under the impression that heaven just don't work for them without them knowing how to fill out their withdrawal slip. And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of Christians that are going along with unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayer. And they're angry, they're frustrated, they're discouraged, they're mad, they're living unfulfilled lives, they don't want to talk about God because God let them down as far as they're concerned. And the attitude is, you know what, you listen to somebody telling you how to pray and you can actually get results. Huh, I wouldn't listen to them at all. Pour me another drink. Bob, pour me another drink. And they're just trying to impact Christians to try to keep Christians from having faith. And they don't know they're being used of the devil. They're being used of the devil. And the Bible says, when you encounter difficulties and circumstances, don't what? Don't you let go of your faith with patience? Allow your faith and your patience to work so that you'll be entire, lacking nothing. And what does lacking nothing mean? Lacking nothing. What does lacking nothing mean? You got it all. You are operating in abundance. And this is so real. This is so real. In Corinthians, Paul said, through the abundance of the revelation, that means the knowledge that I received from God, I was going to live above the normal standard of life, above measure. And he said, for that reason, the devil was trying to attack me to try to keep me from living at the level of what I knew I'd received from God. That's the way he described it. The devil said, man, if Paul stands up, everybody's going to start standing up. I mean, if the person that's in your row just stood up on their seat right now and stand up, I'm Nelson Mandela. You know, I'm just teasing now. You know, but that, <laughs> y'all didn't take, you didn't get that at all. You know, when the end of the movie, Nelson Mandela, I'm Nelson Mandela, I'm Nelson Mandela. Okay. <laughs> y'all didn't see the movie? Nelson Mandela? Where all the kids were saying at the end, I'm Nelson Mandela in class. Hey, what do y'all do with your time? Okay. Anyhow, no, the point. <laughs> Here's my point. My, my point is this. If the person you're sitting on the road with, and i got to explain my joke, don't tell them. That's what you keep telling me. If you've got to explain your joke, your punchline is gone. Leave it alone. I should just turn the microphone over to my daughter, Lauren, load in, and let her tell the joke because she always is funny. Okay. <laughs> All right, now, but if the person that you're sitting next to on your row stood up, while I'm teaching, stood up and decided to stand on the seat cushion of the pew and was standing there consistently while I'm teaching, wouldn't everybody's attention be drawn to them? Why? Because they're doing something out of the norm. They're standing up above the norm. And the person who's standing up above the norm automatically draws attention. See, this teaching that you're receiving, this is some teaching that's going to cause you to stand up above the norm. You start praying and getting answered prayer, I'm telling you, your neighbors are going to trip. And I'm not saying, I'm not speaking negatively if, if they're believers, praise the Lord. But there, there are people that think, I can just go to any church, and as long as I just go to church, put in my time, it's all good. And they're not learning things that will cause them to have a change. But now here you are, you live right next to them, and next thing you know, your place is changing. You're rolling differently. Kids are happy and blessed. And they're looking at you like, don't you know kids are supposed to be a problem? You're like, no, no, they, my kids aren't a problem at all. They're the, we're all having a good time. Life is good. The husband loves me. Wife loves me. You understand? I'm just, life is good. They're looking at you like, wait a minute. Oh, life can't be like that. Life ain't supposed to be like that. You act like you know how to work the Rubik's Cube. Like you can really make life work for you. I can. I'm just doing it by the book. Well, you mean, I go to church. I go to church too. Yeah, but just going to church is not enough. Just like sitting in the garage don't make you a car. <laughs> nah, I can get one on that. <laughs> Some of y'all got that one. <laughs> 
But you've got to learn. You've got to grow. You've got to be informed. You've got to know how to make out the withdrawal slip. I remember when I got my first bank account. My parents told me, we opened up an account for you, savings account for book. Now when you come in and get your money, you got to fill out your, your withdrawal slip like this. Somebody's got to teach you that. If you don't know how to do that, even though the money is there for you, you can still go without it. And we saw without denying it. The Bible says you have an account with your name on it. Undefiled, incorruptible, and that won't fade away. Where is it? In heaven. Is it God telling you that so that he can keep you from enjoying it? No. He's got it systematically set up so the devil can't rip you off. I've yet to see a bank robber take a gun, mask, and go up into heaven and tell him, oh, give me that money that belongs to Gary Ziegler. You, you can't do that. God don't play that. I'm just saying, I wouldn't miss these lessons. Amen. How to pray correctly. Now. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness, and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you. Be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.